morning students today i'll be starting a new system that is gastrointestinal tract so gi tract it is a fundamental design of the nature to provide nutrition to the individual which is crucial for one's survival the nutrient requirement of the body is achieved normally by ingestion food that we eat cannot enter blood stream directly unless digested and assimilated appropriately into smaller particles in the lumen of GIT. So the food particles that enter the GIT as large particles must be broken down and into smaller absorbable molecules in the intestine and stomach to cross the GI epithelium and finally to enter the blood or limb. So when food enters the GI system starting from mouth, exocrine secretions otherwise called gastrointestinal secretions pour into the tract. So these gastrointestinal secretions mainly salivary, gastric, pancreatic, biliary and intestinal secretions contain enzymes that split various food materials into their absorbable form. This is called digestion of food. And the digestion along with the motility, gastrointestinal motility and then uh, that will help in the absorption of the digested food. So we will see all these uh, intestinal secretions in the coming classes. But first of all, today we will see the structure and functional organization of the GI tract. So as you already know, uh, the gastrointestinal tract starts with the mouth and ends with the anus. So uh, these are open at both the ends. So the, in the mouth, the opening which contains the anterior two thirds of the tongue is called the oral cavity or buccal cavity. So you can see here the oral cavity and then the other parts, the mouth continues with the pharynx and then esophagus and then the stomach. So esophagus here, then stomach, small intestine and the large intestine. And in the larynx, sorry, in the pharyngeal part, there are three parts, nasopharynx, oropharynx and laryngopharynx. So this laryngopharynx continuous with the larynx and then trachea that is again respiratory system. So in GI tract we have oral cavity and then pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small intestine and large intestine ending with the anus. So the picture shows the structural characteristics of the GI wall. So different parts of the GI tract are specialized for carrying out different functions that is digestion and absorption and also other functions like excretion of waste materials, fluid and electrolyte balance, providing immunity and also the hosting the bacterial flora. So apart for conducting all these functions, the different parts of tract are uh, in the GIT are present. But for all these different parts, the basic structural characteristics are seen. So the structural of the GI tract is having three, four layers. So from inside to outside, it is muscular uh, mucosal layer and then submucosal, muscularis layer and then serosal. In the mucosa, if you can see in the picture, it is having again the innermost simple squamous epithelial layer and the uh, lamina propria containing the connective tissue. It has the glands and then the ducts and then the blood vessels and the outermost muscularis layer of mucosa, muscularis mucosa. And then the submucosal layer, it, it is the connective tissue layer which present outside the mucosa. It contains the blood vessels, lymphatics and then a network of nerve fibers. See here, you can see this is submucosal nerve plexus. It is otherwise called Meissner's nerve plexus. And then the layer outside the submucosa is the muscularis layer. It is having uh, two layers that is circular muscle fibers and the longitudinal muscle fibers. So the circular forms the inner layer and longitudinal forms the outer layer. In between the circular and longitudinal, you can see here, in between these circular and longitudinal muscle layers, we have again a network of nerve fibers called myentric nerve fibers, nerve plexus or orbax plexus. And the outermost layer is the serosal layer. It just helps in the attachment of gut to the surrounding structures. 
The innervation of GI tract includes the intrinsic and extrinsic nervous system. So the intrinsic nervous system is also called as enteric nervous system and it controls the second to second activities of the gut including motility, local blood flow and the epithelial and endocrine secretions. All of the cell bodies of enteric nervous system lie within the wall of the GI tract. It consists of intrinsic and extrinsic afferent and different neurons as well as interneurons. And there are a lot of neurons in the gut. When compared to the spinal cord, there are more than 100 million neurons within the GI tract. In the brain, there are approximately 100 billion neurons and vagus nerve approximately 2000 neurons. So this is the picture showing the intrinsic nervous system where you can see here the mesonous plexus which is present in the submucosal layer and the myentric plexus which is present in the between the circular and longitudinal muscular layer of the GI tract. So this is myentric or Arbax plexus. The myentric plexus consists mostly of linear chain of many interconnecting neurons that extends along the entire length of GIT. When this plexus is stimulated, its principal effects are increased tonic contraction or tone of the gut wall, increased intensity of rhythmic contractions and slightly increased rate of rhythmical contraction and also increased velocity of conduction of excitatory waves along the gut wall causing rapid movement of gut peristaltic waves. And the functions of this myentric plexus include control of the motility of gut that is the main function of the plexus and also along with the control of motility inhibition of pyloric sphincter and inhibition of ileocecal valve. And the next plexus is submucosal or Meissner's plexus. It is mainly concerned with the controlling function within the inner wall. It controls the secretory activity and blood flow to the gut. So in contrast to the myentric plexus, it is mainly concerned with the controlling function within the inner wall and by receiving sensory signals from the mucosal epithelium and from the stretch receptors in the wall of elementary canal, it helps to control the local intestinal secretion, local absorption and local contraction of the submucosal muscle. And the neurotransmitters involved are ACH, NE, norepinephrine, ATP, dopamine, cholecystokinin, sub, uh, substance P, VIP, somatostatin, bombesin, metencephalin and luencephalin. So in this picture you can see the intrinsic nervous system or the enteric nervous system is again controlled by the sympathetic and parasympathetic that is extrinsic nervous system. So the inner epithelial cells of the uh, gastrointestinal tract having the efferent sensory nerves. So these nerves also again supply to the intrinsic nervous system and also send signals to the prevertebral ganglia, spinal cord and brainstem. The law of intestine is the local stimulation of gut produces excitation above and inhibition below the excited spot. These effects are dependent on the activity of local nervous mechanism. So coming to the autonomic innervation or the extrinsic nervous system of gut, we have the parasympathetic and sympathetic innervation. So the parasympathetic innervation as you can see in the picture, it is made up of cranial and sacral divisions. The blue ones are the parasympathetic. It is made up of cranial and sacral nerves. The cranial sympathetic fibers originate in the medulla and comes through vagus and supply the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, pancreas and first half of large intestine. And the sacral fibers originate in the sacral spinal cord, pass through the pelvic nerves to hypogastric ganglion as a postganglionic fiber, supply the distal half of large intestine and rectum. In the functions of this parasympathetic, okay, so before uh, going into the functions, I'll tell uh, about the sympathetic supply also. So the fibers arise from the eighth thoracic to the second lumbar spinal segment. So these pass through the lateral sympathetic chain to continue as planktonic nerves. The peak ganglionic fibers relay in celiac and mesenteric autonomic ganglions. And the postganglionic fibers run along the blood vessels to terminate mainly on the neurons of enteric nervous system. So uh, these sympathetic innervate all the portions of GIT rather than being more extensively supplied to portions near the oral cavity and anus 
as is true for parasympathetics. So these uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic, you remember the parasympathetic from medulla that is vagus and sacral and the sympathetic from thoracic 8 to second lumbar. So in this picture you can see the sympathetic post ganglionic innervation is from uh, celiac superior mesenteric and inferior mesenteric and the parasympathetic preganglionic innervation of the gut is through vagus nerve and sacral preganglionic nerves and the dual innervation of archons. So uh, if you see the heart, uh, kidney, all those uh, vital organs, they are su also supplied by parasympathetic and sympathetic. So the parasympathetic influence on these organs are inhibitory and whereas the sympathetic effect on these organs are excitatory. When you see the uh, GIT, the same sympathetic and parasympathetic, but the action is reversed. So this is very important. Sympathetic effect on the GI tract is mainly inhibitory and the parasympathetic effect on the GI tract is excitatory. Okay, so now we'll uh, just revise or we'll see the functions of the parasympathetic. It increases the activity of enteric nervous system, thus enhance the activity of all the gastrointestinal functions. It causes excitation of all the musculature of the gut except the sphincters to which it inhibits. There occurs an increase in gastrointestinal motility and secretory activity. And whereas the sympathetic stimulation causes vasoconstriction and excitation of the sphincters and smooth muscles of muscularis mucosa throughout the uh, GI tract and it causes inhibition of motility of gut. And the, coming to the electrical activity of the GI tract, an action potential is elicited anywhere within the muscle mass. It generally travels in all directions in the muscle. Smooth muscle of the gastrointestinal tract is excited by almost continual slow intrinsic electrical activity. So these uh, electrical activity can be divided into slow waves and spikes. Most gastrointestinal contractions occur rhythmically and this rhythm is determined mainly by the frequency of so-called slow waves of smooth muscle membrane potential that is not action potential. The slow rising and falling changes in the RMP resting membrane potential that intensity usually varies between 5 and 15 millivolts. The cause the cause of these waves is not exactly known, probably might be due to slow undulation of the activity of sodium potassium pump. These waves determine the rhythm of most gastrointestinal contractions. In the frequency ranges in different parts of the human GI tract from 3 to 12 per minute. The rhythm of contraction of body of stomach is usually 3 per minute and duodenum is 12 per minute and of the ileum 8 to 9 per minute. The interstitial cells of Kajal are the electrical pacemakers for smooth muscle cells. These cells form a network with each other and are interposed between the smooth muscle layers with synaptic like contacts to the smooth muscle cells. The interstitial cells of Kajal undergo cyclical changes in the membrane potential due to unique ion channels that periodically open and produce inward current that may generate slow wave activity. The slow waves usually do not by themselves cause muscle contraction in most parts of the GI tract except in the stomach. Instead, they mainly excite the appearance of intermittent spike potentials and the spike potentials in turn actually excite the muscle contraction. So the spike potentials are the true action potentials. They occur automatically when the resting membrane potential of the gastrointestinal tract smooth muscle becomes more positive than about minus 40 millivolts. The normal resting membrane potential of the gut is between minus 50 to minus 60 millivolts. Each time the peaks of the slow waves temporarily become more positive than minus 40 millivolts, spike potentials appear on these peaks. The higher the slow wave potential rises, the greater the frequency of spike potential ranging between 1 to 10 spikes per second. These spike potentials last 10 to 40 times as long in GIT muscle as that in large nerve fibers, each spike lasting as long as 10 to 20 milliseconds. 
influx of large number of calcium ions to enter along with the small number of sodium ions are these therefore are called calcium sodium channels or sodium calcium channels slower to open and close remain slower to open and close and remain open for long time and the long duration of action potentials baseline voltage that is about minus 56 millivolts of the smooth muscle resting membrane potential can change so this is the picture showing the spike potentials which is a normal basic electrical rhythm of the gi tract and the same mechanical recording will be appearing like this and this is under the effect of acetylcholine and epinephrine where you can see increase in the number of spike potentials and the mechanical recording will be like this in the continuous repetitive spike potentials uh, will give the greater the frequency and the degree of contraction also increases the hormones and other factors that bring about continuous partial depolarization of the smooth muscle membrane without causing the action potentials continuous entry of calcium ions into the interior of the cell and the afferent sensory nerve fibers these can be stimulated by the irritation of gut mucosa extensive distension of the gut and presentive presence of specific chemical substances in the gut so in the previous picture i have shown you uh, in the along with the extrinsic and intrinsic nervous system the efferent sensory nerve nerve fibers are also present which are in, stimulated by the irritation of gut mucosa and extensive distension of the gut and presence of specific chemical substances in the gut and the gastrointestinal reflexes are the reflexes from the gut to the spinal cord or brain stem and then back to the git the reflexes from stomach and duodenum to the brain stem and back to the stomach by way of various nerves to control the gastric motor and secretory activity and the pain reflexes that cause general inhibition of the entire git defecation reflexes that travel from colon and rectum to the spinal cord and back again to produce a powerful colonic rectal and abdominal contractions required for defecation the intrinsic reflex circuits exist in the gut so this is oral and aboral side that is the pressure is from oral to aboral so these are the intrinsic reflex circuit which are present the receptors are from the gut itself and also the effect is seen in the gut itself so these are the intrinsic reflex circuits so the intrinsic and extrinsic sensory neurons initiate gut reflexes So the reflexes involving the sympathetic infection in innervation, such reflexes transmit signals for long distances. So these are also called long loop reflexes, which include gastrocolic reflex involves the signals from stomach cause evacuation of the colon, and enterogastric reflex involves the signals from small and large intestine that inhibit gastric motility and secretion, and coloilial reflex, which involves signals from colon, which inhibit emptying of ileal contents into the colon. so you can see the intrinsic and extrinsic sensory neurons so these are the intrinsic neurons and the extrinsic are from vagal afferents vagal afferents and also the parasympathetic and sympathetic so here you can see the sympathetic spinal afferents so these initiate the gut reflexes like gastrocolic and enterogastric reflexes and there are other intestinal reflexes like peritoneal intestinal reno intestinal and vesico intestinal reflexes the peritoneal intestinal reflex results from irritation of peritoneum it strongly inhibits the excitatory enteric nerves and thereby can cause intestinal peristal paralysis especially in patients with peritonitis and reno and vesico intestinal inhibit the intestinal activity as a result of kidney and bladder irritation till now we have seen the general structure and functional organization of the gastrointestinal tract so now we will go into the salivary secretion the saliva is a viscous transparent liquid secreted by the cells of the salivary glands so the salivary glands as you know there, there are uh, parotid glands sublingual and submandibular glands so the anatomical part you already know it and the salivary flow facilitates the speech mastication food bolus formation and its swallowing and also general oral health and function 
so uh, the salivary secretion uh, it is called whole or total saliva so it is composed of the water proteins electrolytes and organic molecules from the glands and the microbiota that is oral bacteria viruses and fungi and the lining cells that is epithelial keratin from the oral cavity and other bronchial nasal secretions and the extrinsic substances like food debris paste toothpaste and mouth rinse components and also blood and blood derivatives so all these will be forming the whole saliva and the total volume secreted is 1200 to 1500 ml per day so which is uh, comprised by all these uh, glands parotid gland 20% sublingual gland 7 to 8% and the minor glands less than 10% submandibular gland uh, comprises the major part that is 65 to 70% so the factors affecting the com composition of the saliva are the time of the day source of secretion pathology present in the person flow rate differential gland contribution the circadian rhythm nature of stimuli the diet and nutrition so the out of all these the flow rate is the important one at high flow rates there is less time for reabsorption and secretion therefore the saliva is most like the initial secretion by the snr cells thus with increase in the flow rate concentration of ions changes and at low flow rates there is more time for reabsorption and secretion therefore modified saliva under resting conditions contain low concentration of sodium low concentration of chloride and bicarbonate and also high concentration of potassium so what are the composition uh, what are all the contents of this saliva we will see now so the resting state the flow rate per minute and the resting state in whole for the whole saliva is 0.2 to 0.4 ml per minute and parotid gland saliva is 0.04 and the sublingual gland and submandibular is 0.1 and stimulated state the whole saliva production will be increased 2 to 5 and the ph is also uh, 6.7 to 7.4 that is more alkaline towards little bit towards uh, uh, acidic to neutral ph and parotid gland is 6 to 7.8 and sublingual submandibular is 6 to 7.4 so the total amount as i have already told you 1200 to 1500 ml in 24 hours and the consistency is slightly cloudy due to presence of cells and mucin ph is usually slightly acidic 6.35 to 6.85 specific gravity is this much and freezing point is 0.07 to 0.34 degrees centigrade so the main solid composition of saliva consists of organic and inorganic constituents so in the organic part secretory proteins like enzymes uh, amylase ribonuclease calicrin esterase cystatin peroxide lysozymes lactoferrin acid phosphatase prolin rich proteins glycoproteins and immunoglobulins and the blood clotting factors desquamated epithelial cells microorganism products all these are organic components and the inorganic components are sodium potassium calcium chlorine bicarbonate like this the, all the electrolytes will form the inorganic composition of saliva so this uh, page or this slide is very important remember the composition of saliva it contains organic and inorganic so water forms the major part that is 99% only the 1% is solid composition in that 1% again the organic and inorganic Uh, divisions are present so organic part mainly enzymes and immunoglobulins and other uh, cells and microorganism products like that and in our, in inorganic mainly the electrolytes are present in coming to the phases of uh, salivary secretion that is the cephalic phase buccal phase and gastrointestinal phase so cephalic phase refers to the secretion of saliva before entering of food into the mouth it is caused by condition reflex initiated by mere smell sight or smell of the food and buccal phase refers to the secretion of saliva caused by stimulation of buccal receptors by presence of food in the mouth so it is an unconditioned reflex partially regulated by the appetite area of the brain and the esophageal or uh, gastrointestinal that includes esophageal gastric and intestinal phases which refers to the stimulation of salivary glands by the entry of food through all this uh, esophagus gastric and intestinal uh, areas
okay so three phases cephalic buccal and uh, gastrointestinal phases so there is how the saliva is formed two stage model of salivary secretion is uh, present so which says that the primary secretion of saliva which occurs in the acinar cells of the salivary gland they secrete the saliva into the salivary ducts initially so it is formed by trans transudation that is uh, pressure filtration of the plasma and is therefore isotonic it has the same sodium chloride potassium and bicarbonate as the plasma but it is soon modified by the salivary duct so the ductal cells that line the tubular portion of the salivary gland change the composition of initial saliva by the following process that is reabsorption of sodium and chloride occurs in the ductal cells therefore the concentration of these ions is lower than the plasma so you can see here reabsorption of sodium and chloride ions and secretion of potassium and bicarbonate therefore the concentration of these ions are higher in the than their plasma so the modified saliva becomes hypotonic in the ducts because the ducts are relatively impermeable to water so because the more solutes than water is absorbed by ducts the saliva becomes dilute relative to the plasma so that's why the saliva contains 99% of water so here the primary secretion contains the amylase containing the primary secretion nearly isotonic and in the salivary ducts it will be becoming hypotonic so now coming to the control or regulation of the salivary secretion so it is under uh, two ways that is one is parasympathetic control and other is sympathetic control so it is under entirely under autonomic nervous system reflex so unlike other gastrointestinal glands there is no hormonal regulation of salivary secretion so its production is unique in that it is increased both by parasympathetic and sympathetic activity so however the parasympathetic activity is more important so here you uh, remember there is no hormonal regulation only neural regulation that to both the sympathetic and parasympathetic increases the salivary secretion in the former parasympathetic activity is more pronounced so the parasympathetic nerve supply as you know is from the uh, inferior salivary nucleus of the medulla and also that is to the par parotid glands and the submandibular and sublingual glands are supplied by the fibers originating from the superior salivary nucleus so these are secretomotor to the salivary glands so the condition reflex Uh, by the sight and smell of the food or even the thought of the food increases the salivary secretion and also the unconditional reflex initiated by the stimulation of receptors in the buccal cavity so the receptors and afferents uh, from there to the salivary center so salivary center will be in the superior and inferior salivary nuclei so this is the way okay superior and inferior salivary nuclei and the efferents are the uh, which stimulate the glands the submandibular and sublingual glands so and the from the inferior salivary nucleus they stimulate the parotid glands so this is the parotid inferior salivary nucleus superior both submandibular and sublingual so this will be arising to the going to the spinal cord so salivary glands the parasympathetic nerve stimulation causes the salivary glands to secrete large volume of watery fluid that is high in electrolytes but low in proteins this this liberates how the process uh, actually the production of saliva occurs is that uh, a proteolytic enzyme uh, calicrin from the gland cells which acts on the alpha 2 globulin in the interstitial fluid to form body kinin it causes local release of vip and this increases the saliva production by increasing the transport process in the acinar and ductal cells and by causing vasodilation of blood vessels of the gland so that is the process of secretion of the salivary gland uh, saliva from the salivary glands when the parasympathetic supply is stimulated 
and coming to the sympathetic supply uh, the effects are vasoconstriction in the salivary glands and transient secretion of very small amount of thick viscid saliva rich in mucus and other organic constituent the receptors on the snr and ductal cells are beta adrenergic and the second messenger is the cyclic amp so that's how both the sympathetic and parasympathetic increases the salivary secretion so lastly coming to the functions of the saliva it acts as a buffer it protects against the demineralization and it provides lubrication and it re it causes remineralization by strathrin phosphate calcium providing all these ions lubrication is by glycoproteins and mucins and protection against demineralization is by production of mucins calcium and phosphate and by having the bicarbonate phosphate and proteins it will be acting as a buffer so it is an effective antibacterial which contains the lysozymes lactoferrin lactoperoxidase immunoglobulins and cystatins and it is an antifungal because it contains an immunoglobulins and chromogranes and antiviral because it contains cystatins mucins immunoglobulins and secretory leukocyte so first the bolus formation uh, with the addition of mucin and water with the food it helps in the formation of bolus the saliva and then the taste of the eatables that is because of addition of gastrin plus water to the eatables it we will perceive the taste and also it aids in the digestion of food because of the presence of amylase protease and lipase enzymes and also it has a role in mastication and deglutition it which by which the actual process of gastric motility starts in the oral cavity itself in the in digestive functions the initial starch digestion starts by alpha amylase present in the saliva so the role of salivary amylase is limited by short duration of salivary action so when the bolus of food reaches the stomach it mixes with the gastric juice and stops the action of uh, salivary amylase so it acts on the digested it acts on the uh, boiled starch salivary amylase is an alpha amylase which acts on the boiled starch which finally digested to produce the maltose so uh, this is the difference for the salivary amylase and pancreatic amylase salivary amylase acts on the boiled starch and it has a role in speech because it lubricates the oral, oral mucosa it aids in the speech and it has an uh, it acts as a vehicle for excretion of certain heavy metals and also during state of dehydration it reduces uh, the salivary secretion is reduced which induces the so thus it acts in the uh, temperature regulation in coming to the applied aspects of the salivary secretion there is a degenerative condition called jogren syndrome uh, also called sicca syndrome it is an autoimmune disorder described as a triad of keratoconjunctivitis sicca xerostomia and rheumatoid arthritis the two types are present one is primary and secondary so all these will be together called jogren syndrome and other uh, applied aspects are xerostomia that is dry mouth or cotton mouth because of hyposalivation or uh, tylism and the hyper salivation is opposite of that excess salivary secretion is present physiologically in pregnancy it is present and pathological is called tylism or siluria or silosis so the causes for this xerostomia are dehydration or renal failure jogres syndrome and radiotherapy and the drugs and the causes for hypersalivation is decay of tooth or neoplasm and disease of foregut cerebral palsy and parkinsonism so that's all thank you